Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 90. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey. And oh, man, you know what's great? What's great is that in this world today, this world of technology, you can reach many, many people and you never know just who you may run into, even on a podcast. Most importantly, I think today's guest is going to share with you decades, literally decades of wisdom that is going to help yourself. It's going to help me. It's going to help everybody who listens to this take more action, move faster, move at the speed of instruction, as we always like to say, and most importantly, raise a whole bunch of capital. Now, before we get there, uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, here's what I want you to do. Go straight over to learninvestingnow.com. That's a learninvestingnow.com. And you know what? If you've not done it and it's not your first time, go anyway. Learninvestingnow.com because I'm going to begin to show you how to learn investing and now. Dot com because I, I want you in action. I don't want you just listening and consuming information. It's time to take action, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do it together right there. Today's guest, in my opinion, uh, literally wrote the book on what it is that many of us are looking to do in terms of building cash flow, raising capital, and making things happen. It's been practicing real estate. I, you know, doctors practice. We perform real estate miracles, maybe, uh, for a number of decades. And one of the things that I have learned is that it is easier to learn from the mistakes of others and the wisdom of others than to make all the mistakes myself. And I am looking forward uh, to introducing you to the, <laughs> the, the, the top of the top possibilities when it comes to knowing how to do syndications, knowing how to raise capital, knowing what they're all about, and most importantly, making the information accessible to you and I. And when I say literally wrote the book, I do mean literally wrote the book. He's got a book, Principles of Real Estate Syndication, uh, and it covers a wide gamut of ways to make that thing happen for you. So therefore, you probably now know that I'm talking about none other than Mr. Samuel Freshman. How you doing, sir? Very good, Jay. Very good. I am so glad that you are here today. Thank you for investing your time here uh, with us, uh, and we hope to be able to produce a return for you. Thank you for having me. So um, one of the things that I like asking people, uh, especially entrepreneurs, is that I look at today's entrepreneurs as the same as yesterday's superheroes. Superheroes, they, they got capes and tights and all these things, and they do great things, and they save people. Uh, and I think today's entrepreneurs, especially real estate entrepreneurs, do that very same thing. However, every entrepreneur has a beginning. Uh, they have an, what I call an origin story. What I would really like to know is before you were Samuel Freshman, professional syndicator, promoter, author, and all these other things, who was Sam Freshman? Uh, I was uh, a recent graduate from uh, Stanford University and Stanford Law School, and uh, uh, I had gone to uh, law school because my dad hated lawyers and felt we needed one in the family. <laughs> and he, he said, go there, and I'll teach you about business later. And I uh, graduated thinking I was going to go into business with him. And we had a talk, and I said, Dad, I, really, I got two brothers that are already in the family business. I think that's enough. Uh, I'd like to practice law, but I don't know what to do. My dad, who'd only been in California for probably two or three weeks before I graduated, was a very, very astute guy. And I said, Dad, should I be a tax lawyer? Should I be a litigator? Should I be a tort lawyer, etc." And you know what he shot back to me? He said, Sam, go into real estate. That's where all the money's made in California. So that's 
that's how I got into it. Was wow. Basically on, on very good advice. And uh, I saw that I saw how my clients were getting rich and decided uh, that's enough of that. And uh, after practicing for some time, uh, oh, several years, uh, I did a real estate deal. I was always dabbling on my own. And I made more money in that one real estate deal than I did in 20 years of practicing law. And I said, it's time to quit the law and just stick with the real estate. That's yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I have made every single mistake that you could possibly make in real estate, but I try to do it only once, and I've lived a long time. I, I say the two biggest mistakes I've ever made was I didn't buy enough, and I sold too soon. Wow, that's interesting. I, I like that. And so it, it's interesting when you say <laughs> that, I mean, okay, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said that first deal, you made more <laughs> With that one deal than you had tw in, did you say 20 years practicing? 20 years practicing law. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I mean, I've heard people say things like I made more in one deal than I used to make in one year, but never 20 years. So that I, we'll, we'll call that a really, really big hint. So when that hint comes and when you get the, you're like, okay, I should go in this direction. How do you make the the mental switch from attorney to let's do this real estate thing full time? Well, it, it was sort of easy <laughs> to do uh, when I looked at the numbers. Uh, it, I just couldn't afford to continue to uh, practice. Wow! And uh, the I think uh, since Jay, you're in this as well. Uh, you uh, you know as well as I do that real estate is all about leverage, uh, and uh, since this is a, a discussion really about syndication, if people could just get a hold in their mind, those entrepreneurs that are listening, that all syndication is is taking that leverage that you do with the debt and carrying it one step further and applying it to the equity as well. Yes. It, that and and that's exactly what I meant by making this thing that seems so complicated uh, simple. So, talk to us a little bit. How does in in your mind, how would someone today? How does syndication play a role in today's you know real estate market and etc. Well, it, it, syndication hasn't changed in the uh, sixty some years that I've been uh, involved with it. Um, first for my clients and then for myself. Um, the idea there, the the idea of syndication is basically the same as the idea of uh, real estate. We always talk about real estate as being location, 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 but actually, real estate is more about how you finance your transaction and uh, selecting the right uh, type of financing for the the time that you're in. Uh, Right now, we're in very low uh, interest rates. We just closed the deal, uh, locked the rate uh, Monday. Uh, we got a 30-year loan at 4.3% on an apartment building that we're buying. Uh, that's probably, we hit the all-time low. Uh, we could have taken a 10-year loan probably at somewhere around 3.9, but for for that little extra spread, we've eliminated all interest rate risk for the next 30 years. Yep. That Now, you bring up a topic that I think sometimes we, we may not consider or many people may not uh, understand completely, but because when you look at it, you say, well, 3.9, why would you pay the little extra? Could you talk to us a little bit about what you look at when you say interest rate risk? Well, the interest rate, uh, rate risk is the following. Uh, today, um, if you let's say you took a 10-year loan at 3.9, well, in 10 years, no one knows what the interest rates would be. If you if you've used uh, uh, a maximum leverage, which we don't recommend, uh, when you come up for renewal, if the interest rates are six percent, 
you'll have to give the building back to the lender. I don't like doing that. So I wanted to eliminate that risk by using uh, a basically a long-term fixed rate, and I'll pay a little extra for that insurance. Also, every time you refinance, if we're talking about 30-year 30, 30 period, you're going to refinance at least twice more, and that involves uh, extra charges, points for the new loan, uh, new appraisals, uh, and uh, just uh, a lot of things that uh, would interfere with my sleep at night. <laughs> so we we generally see, we're a little different than than uh, most companies in that we're buying for long term. We assume that when we buy a property, we're never going to be able to sell it. So we don't buy anything that is dependent on reselling. Uh, we have to be comfortable with it that we'd be happy with it if we had to hold it forever. Got it. And I liked how you termed that. You said that the difference, the spread, the delta between the 3.9 or the 4.3, you called that insurance. That's right. I like that. Uh, so it, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You're, you're eliminating the interest rate risk, which is where I, I have friends who are worth literally hundreds of millions of dollars they're, re they're real players, and then they're wiped out in the next crash uh, because they bar instead of taking a 66% or a 70% loan, they take an 85 or an 80% loan. And when it comes time to renew and the interest rate is higher, the uh, debt service wipes out the cash flow. And I'm just curious, how many times have you seen that happen? Five. Five. Okay. I've, I've been... 60 years have been through five recessions. Wow. And still going on. I love it. And I love the fact that you're like, yeah, and I'm buying another building just yesterday. That's great. So with all of this, uh, you know, experience and the things that you've seen, when it comes to syndication, what is that? What do you see the new person, the person who's never done one? What is like the number one thing that you see that they don't do that they should do? They don't do enough due diligence. Real estate is a business where, uh, well, you've heard of Murphy's Law. <laughs> yeah, I think and I've Murphy's been introduced to Murphy personally once or twice. Okay, well, Murphy is what can go wrong, Will. And, the other, and, and what I say, and it's in the, my savings, list, Murphy was an optimist. Gotcha. You have to think about that. For a minute, but um, if you're looking at a piece of real estate and you don't find anything wrong with it, you simply have not looked far enough. The key to success, long-term success in real estate, is determine what the problems are with the specific property you're uh, looking at or the, specific, uh, the project, and figure out whether it's something that you can solve. If it is, then you go forward. If it isn't, you have the wisdom then to just pass. But uh, so many people are in a hurry to make a deal that they make, that's where they make their mistakes. Uh, this is particularly true with environmental matters. Uh, again, I've seen people buy a property and then have to pay more for environmental, remediating environmental contamination than they paid for the property. Wow. So you, you want to be sure that you uh, have done all your environmental work. You've checked the direction of the neighborhood. You don't want to buy in a neighborhood where uh, it's uh, getting distressed. Uh, take a good look at the cars in the neighborhood. If a lot of cars are up on blocks in people's front yards, I don't think that's a neighborhood you want to invest in. Uh, it's all there. Everything can is discoverable, but it takes time and work. Um, it's it's not, not easy. Uh, occasionally, some people get lucky, but... Um, that, again, is very high. I, I'm not uh, too much for risk. I'll, I'd be happy to uh, just have my money double every 10 years and uh, not take risk. So the, when somebody presents you with a deal that's too good to be true, my experience is that's exactly what it is. So let me ask this question. When you first started... Were you also of the same opinion that the you were happy to let the money double every ten years? 
Yeah, I've I've always been uh, more on the conservative side, and I've always been uh, tended to move towards, uh, let's say the the better properties. Although the returns are not as high, but the risks are not as great either. Um, and when you say better properties, what do you mean specifically? Well, we talk about the neighborhood being a, an A, B, or C neighborhood. The A being the highest level. That I generally can't afford, and the returns are lowest in that in that area. Uh, but the appreciation is usually uh, greater. Uh, and the C is the more distressed neighborhoods. Uh, so we, we concentrate on the B, right in the middle. Good now, solid neighborhoods. Everybody's got a job. Uh, people take care of their properties. And uh, the rents are sort of in the middle, which... Uh, is probably uh, uh, less exciting than being on either of the ends. <laughs> Indeed. But uh, less, less problems there. Got it, got it. And then I'm, I, I've got to wonder, with the amount of and volume uh, that you've done and the length of time you've been able to participate in the market, what what would you say would be the most unique or strange syndic thing you've seen syndicated? Oh, my. Well, I've seen uh, theaters, bowling alleys, uh, uh, assisted living, just, just about anything. The most unique things have not been real estate. Uh, horses. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, that's a big area. Well, of course, motion picture theaters, quite often that's the way their financing is. is uh, and in fact, my, the book, Principles of Real Estate Syndication, that you referred to, has a whole section on uh, financing uh, uh, motion pictures in the back, a whole glossary on that. Um, so I, I would say anything that's income producing uh, over a period uh, of time uh, is uh, a, can be a subject of a syndicate. And uh, syndications today are getting down on a pretty low level. Uh, we probably don't have time to go into it today, but uh, if you want to do it on a very low retail level, uh, your listeners should uh, probably look up uh, crowdfunding and, uh, on the Internet and find out what that's about. Um, but... Uh, well, you're actually bringing up a, a topic that I I would love to have your perspective on when you because I, I look at them and in, in different levels. So when you do bring up the, the subject of crowdfunding, obviously, many uh, of those listening right now are either familiar or about to become very familiar with it. In, in your opinion, um, how do you see that uh playing in the marketplace with the the change in the rules the you know it's it it almost to me feels like it's a free for all to a degree um what it do is. you see what do you see the shakeout being well it'll be sort of like we had uh, uh for a while we had this uh thing on the ticks yeah. uh, it's the in common and of course it, it seemed great to everybody they could trade into these things uh and uh, but uh, they the problem is when you get people who don't really know what they're doing and not really checking out their investments, there is uh, incentive for some people to to take advantage. And of course, most of the ticks failed. Uh, few of them uh, did survive. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that's what. Crowdfunding is just loosening the rules a little too much, and sometime in the next three to five years, we'll see a lot of these deals that are now being sold on the crowdfunding platform fail. Uh, they use a lot of gimmicks to make it look good on the front end, like interest-only loans, uh, overstate the, the potential growth rate. Um, there's just all kinds of, uh, to put it bluntly, shell games that go on when it's e too easy to raise the money. Um, 
So I, I would be cautious. That doesn't mean that there aren't good deals being done, and there's some very responsible crowdfunding companies. Some of them will be at a conference that I'm going to be involved in September 16th, and your listeners could go to creativefinancingconference.com, uh, and uh, we're going to have an all-day conference on some 30 different ways to raise money for your real estate deal, how to get your deal done. Uh, creative, uh, creativefinancingconference.com. It'll be held here in Los Angeles on September 16th. Nice. Now, what would you say if, if so with all of this coming, how do, how do I, how does anyone um, make sure that they are the, the responsible version of the, the uh, crowdfunding company that you mentioned? Uh, well, I think if, if you're, uh, now you're talking about being the entrepreneur or the investor. I, well, I was actually going to go both ways with that, but first I wanted to talk about the entrepreneur, and then I was going to say the investor. All right. Okay, well, I think the entrepreneur needs to have a good team. We talk about you know, the lawyer, the accountant, uh, the uh, due diligence uh, experts. Uh, you need a good team. If you don't really understand real estate uh, and you're just coming in new, get yourself a partner that does. There's... Most everybody knows somebody that's been very successful and uh, is conservative and follows the rules. Uh, and uh, I recommend really on both sides, whether you're the entrepreneur or the, in, or, uh, the investor, to uh, if you don't feel you have the, the knowledge and experience, on your first couple of deals, team up with somebody that does. There's always, uh, at, at any level... Uh, someone who's done this before uh, and been through it that uh, you can find among your contacts. And uh, we'll be, uh, one of the things you, you want to, to, to know when, you're, when you are uh, uh, an investor is does the promoter or sponsor have skin in the game? So... Um, that's one of the first things you want your accountant to be able to check that part out and make sure how much money the entrepreneur has in the deal. So if you're going to be the entrepreneur, then start out on smaller deals uh, w within the scope of your resources. And if you don't have resources, just team up with somebody that does. There's always a lot of people around who... Uh, uh, want to invest, and so take uh, uh, your lawyer, your doctor, or somebody like that who's maybe got, or your banker, uh, who's got some money saved, uh, and bring them in as a co-partner so that you can say that the sponsor has a skin in the game, that has an investment. It doesn't have to be yours, but it, it does have to be one of the sponsors who's got to have some money at risk. I don't know if that answers your question yeah yeah no that's that's absolutely perfect you're answering of i'm sure there are a lot of people who wonder how these things are done and they're learning well here's how these things are done uh and you're you're making it accessible making it simple so that it you know many of us can go out there and continue to do it which is great now with uh if you could though i i would love for you to share with us a little bit more about the conference because i'm sure some people are thinking um i you know, I would like to know more about that. I want to, you know, hang out with, you know, the people who are out there making things happen. How did that conference come about? Okay, now, let me ask you this question. How much time do you actually spend networking? Do you understand its value? More importantly, do you understand how to put yourself in a position to win? And that's what we're really talking about here. Putting yourself in a position to win. I heard Tiger Woods say once is that he wasn't trying to win every round. He was just trying to be in position to win so that when the opportunity came about, he could make something happen. That's what networking is. I know um, you're probably eagerly awaiting what Sam's about to say. And yes, you'll be able to hear it. One of the things that I just want to stress 
It's put yourself in a position to win. Sometimes just by association, you can win. And learning how to master associations as well as networking and making networking work for you. Notice it's not net eating. It's not net playing. It's networking. It's not let's go to play. It's let's go to work. And one of the good things about that is that networking can be fun. And yes, even for those of you who are saying to yourself, but Jay, I'm an introvert and I don't like people. I understand. I do understand. It's something that you can learn. And I'm here to tell you, it's one of those secret things that if you learn to master it and put yourself in a position to win, you can have a shot at something that you may not have ever, ever considered. Keep that in mind as you listen to what Sam has to say. Well, we do a conference every year with uh, UCLA, uh, University of California at Los Angeles, on what is happening in the real estate market. Uh, and um, we just had that conference uh, about a month ago. It's spon- that conference was sponsored by UCLA and Stanford uh, Spire, which is the Stanford Professionals in Real Estate, the real estate alumni. Uh, and we had about 400 people there. That's the seventh year we've done that. And um, we were sold out. And uh, a, lot, a lot of the people that come to that are beginning syndicators or real estate entrepreneurs. And the big question is, how do I get my deal done? How do I finance it? So I said, well, let's do the same kind of conference. Uh, this one will be all day. And we'll be talking about uh, EB-5, which is how to get foreign uh, money. We'll be talking about uh, uh, tax increment financing. We'll be talking about government grants where there's uh, environmental problems and uh, various government programs that will pay for that for you. Um, There'll be six sessions. Uh, It's all day from 8 in the morning till about 5 in the afternoon. And we'll cover, uh, we'll have probably, well, there's six sessions. We'll probably have 25 speakers there uh, telling you the various aspects of uh, how to get your deal done and how to set up the financing. There's probably 40 different ways to finance uh, a real estate acquisition. (laughs) Yeah, uh, tell me about that. Way too many sometimes. <laughs> it's like, how do, you, how do you choose? So with that being the case, uh, let me ask you this. What, um, what do you think are some of the character traits? Like if I've never done this before, if someone's never done it, what are some of the character traits that you've witnessed in a person that, give, that increases their likelihood of being successful? Or what are some of those skill sets you think uh, the entrepreneur needs to practice or have or begin to practice and learn in order to make syndication work for them? Well, I'd say number one is the ability to understand what what you can do and where you need help. Uh, nobody uh, has all of the skills. In other words, my skill is in, in structure, uh, how to do the financing, how to set it up legally, um, uh, how to be uh, creative and, and some, add some value. But I don't know much about the a- actual construction. So I have a person on my team who's a co- uh, contractor uh, who uh, goes to all the uh, environmental classes that the government has, uh, has his contractor's license, dealt with plumbers, uh, carpenters, electricians all his life, and he takes care of that part of it. And then I have somebody else that takes care of the property management and someone else uh, that does uh, the uh, setup and the due diligence. Uh, if, so the number one skill is knowing how to delegate uh, in those areas that uh, you don't have. Now, some people are very good with numbers and uh, some people are not. Um, so uh, if that's something that you're missing, then you may want your accountant or somebody who's good with numbers and projections to play a greater role uh, in you, on your team uh, than they do on mine. That's, that's something that I, I get quite involved in. But 
when it comes to uh, washing the windows or estimating what it's going to cost to fix the roof, I just throw up my hands and say, this is something I don't know. I just have to have somebody else do that part of it. Exactly. So when you're when you do, you're doing your due diligence, you want to have a team of four or five people that so you cover every aspect and find that where that problem is in that particular deal. And that so that person can help guide you to the solution. Indeed. Uh, and and you, you speak to the point that I've I've often tell people because they ask me, I'm I, I'm I'm like you, uh, I don't. I'm not the construction guy, so please don't ask me how much the tubs cost or, you know, or how to fix a tub. Uh, I'll probably know how much they cost, but I won't know how much, you know, I won't know what material to use in, in one situation or another um, until we, you know, we get close. give you one, Jay, this is one thing that uh, uh, illustrates this, and that is the piping, the plumbing in the building. Mm-hmm. I don't know uh, the difference between copper, PVC, uh, and uh, the various other types of materials that are used and what, the re- what their lives are and what expenses all have. So I have m- my guy has to go in there, take a plumber in there with him, determine what that is, and then tell me, well, this is, you got a problem here. This stuff is, is going to deteriorate in three years. And that, or you've got copper throughout and everything's fine and it'll probably be good for another 20. And that's just one item. When I started, we had a checklist of six items in 1960. Today, we have 60 items on that list. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We Our due diligence list is equally, it might be 60 or, or I don't know, it's multiple pages on an Excel sheet. We condense it all down. And so right. I guess when you first started, let's let's talk about this for a second, but when you first started, you you didn't know who that plumber was going to be that could do that for you. So how did you attract them and, and find them? Well, um, I, I was fortunate in that in practicing law, in, in, uh, I was focusing on real estate. So I had had contacts uh, with all the various players, the, the plumbers, the contractors, uh, the, the uh, the lenders, uh, the title companies, uh, you know, all the parties uh, I'd been working with for, for several years before I bought my first deal. Um, and that isn't a bad idea to, to hook up with somebody that's already doing this and just walk around and follow them around for six months or something uh, to get a feel for what's involved. Uh, I don't think you need to take years to do that, but certainly... Um, I'd, I'd recommend at least six months of uh, interning, so to speak, uh, if you're starting out. We uh, we get people that come uh, uh, to our company and offer to work for nothing. Unfortunately, under the labor laws, I don't want to take that chance. <laughs> so <laughs> they have to, have to feel like going to get some value out of them. But I will, you know, I'll hire them for uh, um, fifteen dollars an hour or something and uh, say, okay, now here's what we're going to have you do, and just take them through all the processes. And I say, you know, hopefully by the sixth or seventh month, uh, you'll have learned enough that we can then stop losing money on you. (laughs) uh, Everybody, as I say, they check their family and their friends and their neighbors, will find somebody who... Uh, has a reputation of being successful, and just sort of ask the guy if he can just spend the you know couple months walking around with him, and just listening and watching and running errands for him. Right now, you did something you keep bringing up that I, I think we need to talk about though is your ability to make connections and network. It, it seems as though that seems to be a skill set that is absolutely mandatory, regardless of what role you may be playing. Well, I think, you know, there's a saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's true of any business. That isn't just real estate or, you know, you could have a retail store, you could have a tool and die shop, uh, 
you could uh, be selling automobiles. Your success, uh, I, I'm a great believer in networking. And I would, I would say, and you brought up a good point, that uh, because I focused on that, I had to focus on that when I was practicing law because 60 years ago, lawyers couldn't advertise. It all had to be word of mouth. So uh, as soon as I opened my office, I joined the local junior chamber of commerce. I joined a religious lodge. Uh, I uh, uh, joined a church, in my case, a synagogue. Uh, and uh, before I knew it, uh, my Rolodex <laughs> was uh, pretty full. Uh, and I sort of focused, if I'd go to a party and there were 50 people there, I'd sort of look over the room and figure out where the people were that could help me. I mean, uh, you can't be shy about this. Uh, I can't believe uh, that when I took a, a career test, uh, when I graduated, it said that I was a shy person. I have 6,600 people on my email list. And we're, we're going to be sending out our newsletter shortly. We've had to switch over to email because it's too expensive now to send it regular mail. But um, you just you just sort of have to force yourself out there and uh, go to a few networking classes and read some books on it. it again, it's very simple. It's not uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, networking is, is pretty easy once you get the hang of it, and you're constantly networking. When I'm in an elevator with a stranger, and if I think <clears throat> uh, they may be helpful because I'm in a building with a lot of uh, uh, bankers and lawyers and so on, I'll, I'll just ask the person there, what do you do, and sometimes exchange cards with them. Or I'm waiting for my car in a parking garage after attending a lecture, uh, I'll say to the person standing next to me the same thing, uh, and uh, I'll ask them what they do, and then most people will reply asking what you do, and you'll exchange cards and go from there. Nice, nice. So with with that being the case, what would you say is, I mean, because as I'm talking to you, you, you make it sound as though anyone could actually do this, why do you think many people feel like it's difficult? Well, it's like anything else. You have to sit down and plan. Uh, I learned a long time ago that uh, most successful people uh, spend a certain amount of time planning. I plan my week. I plan my uh, month. I plan my day. I plan my life. The life uh, plans sometimes change somewhat. Uh, but the daily and weekly, weekly ones are generally go according to plan. How you're going to spend your time, where you're going to spend your time, and of course having goals. Uh, when I take on a project, we lay out a timeline um, with goals as to how long it's going to take to do the due diligence, how long it's going to take to get the money for the loan, set up the loan, how long it's going to take to raise the equity. Uh, and everything has has a goal set, uh, so you have overall goals, but you got to slice them up into small ones, uh, and then you it, it's more than planning. Then you have to take action. You have to uh, to have a, to take action. So, how does the person know when it's time to take action? Because I I hear this frequently. I, I want to know more before I do anything. Um, how do you know when to do that? Yeah, because a lot of people You'll, say things like, I, I need to learn more before I take action. And they say that for a long time, a really long time. Definitely more than six months. Well, that's, well then they didn't have a plan. The plan tells you. You're going to say, I'm going to spend so much time, three months, six months, a year, uh, if, if it's going to be longer than a year, I'd say forget it and do something else. Uh, but uh, I think those people are just using that as an excuse. They're afraid to go forward. 
Now, if you want, it depends too on what you want in life. Some people don't need a lot of money. Uh, I, I unfortunately uh, was a monopoly addict when I was a youngster, and so I say I've never spent a day working in my life. I'm still playing monopoly, and so to me, going to work and doing this is fun, and even I've probably gone 30 years beyond when I had to. Uh, as far as you know, I can't, couldn't, I don't need any, haven't needed any more money for many, many years. But I love it. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't do this. Uh, <laughs> used to horseback ride somewhat, but I'm too old for that now. So thank God I still have real estate. To do. <laughs> Definitely but, one uh, way of looking at it. Go ahead. You, you, you know, it's a combination. Plans are no good without action. But action is no good without a plan. I often tell people when I'm doing mentoring, um, you're not going to get from here to there without a road map. If you want to go somewhere, you better have a map on how you're going to get there or you're just spinning wheels. So, But once you've got your map, you better get on that road and start going because you can, or you can spend the rest of your life, and this is what you're talking about. Some people just spend their time making maps. <laughs> right and uh, doing never getting on the road exactly but you keep saying uh, something which I contend as well life is simple it's the it, it's us the people that screw it up and make it complicated <laughs> uh, it, it, everything is very so my, again I was very fortunate my father always had his answer anything I would ask him he would have an answer in um, in one sentence, like I used to say, Dad, how do I determine whether or not I should take this case? It, it's legal, to, but I'm not comfortable with it. Um, and he'd say, it's very simple. Uh, would you want everyone to know, would you want this to appear on the front page of the, the daily newspaper? If you don't care about everybody knowing uh, that you're taking this case and, and doing what the client asks you for, then you've got no problem. If you have any concern about it, just skip it and go on. Nothing was ever, you know, he never gave me a complicated answer. <laughs> that, that is one way to judge it. I love it. Now, one of the last things I, I, I'd love to spend some time with is you were mentioning before that uh, you, you had a book, uh, the 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 title the smartest way to save I, i'd love to know what what um what prompted making uh, that particular uh book and 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 how can uh, someone uh, take advantage uh, of the information that's inside of it okay well what prompted it was that i was hired by a uh, uh a trust company that handled the affairs of a woman who made $6 million a year. Her husband had died and left her royalty income of $6 million a year. And she never had any money. She was always broke. And so they hired me to uh, advise her on how to change her lifestyle. Um, and after I'd spent about three or four hours with that woman one day, the next day I picked up the newspaper, and in it, was a story about a housekeeper who never made more than $50,000, that was her maximum salary, in her lifetime, and had left several million dollars to the local, uh, local university. And that got me thinking, what is it about the way these people live that um, one person on a very small salary could leave millions of dollars, and one person who has a several million dollar income ha never has any money and so that got me into the field of behavioral finance and then of course uh, being in the syndication uh, business and uh, lecturing and teaching and that people always say well how do I get the money to get started and so I said well I'm going to look into this and write a book about it and uh, some of it is pretty simple again uh the main thing is you have to distinguish between wants and needs. We have things we want, 
but we don't necessarily need them. And to, when you're starting out, you can only spend money on needs until you have that stake so you can tell the investors that you have skin in the game. Uh, you, you, should, you need to, to, to be pretty um, restrictive on how you spend your money. Once you've uh, made it and you have uh, financial freedom, which I call having enough money coming in from your investments that you don't have to work, at whatever level that may be, for some people it might be 500,000, for some people it might be 500 million. But uh, until you've attained financial independence, you have to really focus on wants versus needs. Focus on the needs, and if it's a want, uh, forget it till you have expendable cash. And that's what the book's about. And, and you can get all the books on Amazon. You just Look up my name on Amazon and all the books will come up. Nice. And that's extremely simple. Uh, I love it. So uh, what one last thing would you like to share with anyone who's either considering uh, getting started, who has already started, uh, and, and maybe they're experiencing a challenge for the first time? Um, you know, what, what advice would you give them, uh, give anyone to just keep going or, or stop or, or make things happen and change? Well, a, a couple things. First, of course, is to go to the Creative Financing Conference. Uh, and you go to creativefinancingconference.com to sign up. The second thing is, again, very simple. Uh, when you have decisions to make, sometimes we allow our emotions and our uh, background to interfere with making the proper decision. So what the, the trick that I uh, found is to consider that somebody has asked you what they should do in that situation. What would you advise them? And you separate yourself from the problem when you look at it from that angle. And uh, the, the answer will usually come to you pretty quickly. But you can't look at it from, from your own standpoint. You, we all have a lot of baggage we carry. Um, and uh, so uh, that trick is in a book, I think it's called Decisions, or the, um, that came out recently where the whole book was about that. Um, but that, that would be my, if I had to give anyone just one piece of advice, uh, other than the, uh, learn to separate wants from needs, uh, and learn to think long, long term rather than just what happens tomorrow. Nice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard it uh, from the man himself, though, <laughs> literally, as I've said before, wrote the book about it. And most importantly, uh, you've got an opportunity now to actually collaborate and understand and meet up with him through a book, through the, the conference coming up. Uh, again, creativefinancingconference.com. Make sure that you get yourself there September 16th uh, because it will be beneficial. Those are the things that we're looking for. You're looking for those additional resources that can help you take the next step. It's been exciting uh, chatting with you uh, again and giving, and I thank you for giving us the time, your attention, the, the, the desire to continually listen and learn. We look forward to talking to you soon and... Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.